Meeting of Ice House of Full Council. Uh, this meeting is being held remotely and also in person and will be filmed and recorded for live and subsequent broadcasts available through the Council's website. Uh, the Council is a data controller under the General Data Protection Regulations and the Data Protection Act of 2018. Uh, we broadcast and record Council meetings to fulfil our public task obligation to enable members of the public to observe the democratic process. Uh, data collected during the process will be retained in accordance with the Council's published policies available through the Council's websites. Uh, members of the Council are reminded that they should follow the Council's established meeting protocols, including around the use of the chat facility, and that comments made in the chat facility are visible to all participants in the meeting, which may include members of the public who have also received invites to the meeting. Thank you. Do we have any apologies or uh, declarations of interest? Uh, we have no apologies today, Provost. Um, we will now move to a roll call before proceeding to declarations of interest. Can the following members please indicate their presence at the meeting, either in person or remotely? Professor <coughs> Armstrong. Present in the chamber. Professor Brennan. Present in the chamber. Councillor Brooks. In chamber. Councillor Cassidy. Present in chamber. Councillor Cloperty. In chamber. Councillor Crowther. Present at Reeve remotely. Councillor Curley. Present remotely. Councillor Daisley. Present in the chamber. Councillor Jackson. In the chambers. Councillor Law. Present in the chamber. Councillor McCabe. Present in the Chamber. Councillor McCluskey. Present in the Chamber. Councillor McCormick. In the Chamber. Councillor McGuire. Present remotely. Provost McKenzie. In the Chamber. Councillor McBay. In the Chamber. Councillor Moran. Present in the Chamber. Councillor Nelson. Present remotely. Councillor Quinn. Present in the Chamber. Councillor Reynolds, present in the chamber. Councillor Robertson, present in the chamber. Councillor Wilson, present in the chamber. Are there any declarations of interest? <coughs> Thank you, Diana. Members and officers, it doesn't seem like two weeks. Uh, since the passing of Our Majesty Queen Elizabeth. Uh, two very historic weeks in the, for our, our nation. Uh, during these two weeks, a fortnight ago, this afternoon, uh, I received a, a text and a phone call saying that Operation Unicorn was into operation. And by three o'clock, we had our first meeting within the council. I would like to put on record at this time uh, the work done by our chief executive and our head of legal services uh, for the way they pulled together their teams in putting what we had to do locally into, into action. And all credit must go to them. To the, the leader of the council, Councillor McCabe, I would thank him for his wise counsel throughout and his, his guidance to us. Uh, within the council, I think we would be remiss of us if we were not to highlight the work done by our corporate comms department, particularly Mr. Barber and Mr. Coulter, who liaised with the Lord Lieutenant's office and brought through the necessary actions that we were required to undertake. Uh, as well as releasing all the necessary press information that was required. Also mentioned must go to our council officers, Mr. Howie and Mr. Rob, for the very fine way in which they performed uh, their various duties, uh, both the proclamation, the flags, and, when, and their professional support when they supported me in Edinburgh. It was my privilege to take part in so many different pieces of the event, uh, from the proclamation in Paisley, 
<coughs> pardon me, to the proclamation of the up to the service of the Midkirk, to the service of Thanksgiving in St Giles, and to the motion of condolence that was put forward at the Scottish Parliament. <laughs> and I, it was an absolute privilege to represent you and to represent the people in Merkite on that occasion. And I wish that these sentiments that I've issued there how will be duly recorded. It would be remiss of us as a council if we were not to formally uh, note the passing of Her Majesty. Therefore, uh, the motion that I have put forward as agenda item two, on behalf of everyone at Inverfide Council and the entire Inverfide community, the council offers its deepest condolences for our family and the news of the sad passing of Queen Elizabeth II. Throughout her exceptional reign, Queen Elizabeth II was a symbol of strength, compassion and commitment. We will remember with affection and appreciation her lifetime of service, and we join with people across the country, the Commonwealth and beyond, to mourn the loss of such a deeply respected and inspirational monarch. Before I formally propose that, I, I would ask if anybody else has anything to say uh, with regards this past fortnight's activities. I would first of all I go to Councillor Moran, who who was indeed the provost here the last time Her Majesty visited Inverpride. Councillor Moran. Thank you, Provost, for this opportunity to say a few words today. But my personal being with her late Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. Provost, before I tell you my story, I'd like to say a couple of thank yous. Thanks to the then Lord Lieutenant General Shire Kai Clark, without his involvement. The Queen had never been here. Councillor Steve McKay was good at the council time. And my good friend and former Provost Michael McCormick. Provost, my honour came about in a unique set of circumstances. My good friend and Provost Michael McCormick, who spent many years planning for the visit, only for the, the circumstances to change, and we had a, a, a election in eight days after the election, Michael was no longer the provost. That beauty fell on me. So I want to give my thanks to the public for Michael for all the work he'd done beforehand. So then I was the new provost. One of my first duties was to welcome the Queen and Duke there to the other The first thing I wanted to do was to learn a speech. And, and that was the speech was taken from the Queen and all the media assembled. To say it was there was some frightening is an understatement. But we're told the speech would have to last three and a half minutes precisely. So there it was. I have to speak this, this speech for the last three and a half minutes. The first time I tried it, I finished it in 30 seconds flat. <laughs> Panic? No. Practice. And at that point, I had four officers working. <laughs> Jenny Malone, Elena Cooper White, George Barber and Selena Cook. And with the work required, it became possible. On the itself, I was beyond nervous and arrived at Town Hall early. Also, the Lord of the Tenth arrived that day early and were sitting in the Provost Room, Provost, and huge crowds had gathered in Kafkat Square and Clay Square. And someone suggested that me and the Lord of the Tenth should go down and talk to people to, to welcome here to Berkeley, which we did do. So we went down the stair. And we're in the crowd. And just as that, the royal party arrived. At this point, I was beyond nervous. But promise, a major thing happened. As soon as I went to Her Majesty the Queen, immediately all the nerves left me. And I don't know to this day how that happened. We went then to the tented area of the square when she met various local groups. And promised with a makeup of the waterfront and what we're preparing to do with that. And I was astounded with her knowledge. So whoever who had beefed her had done a fantastic job and more importantly, she remembered everything. So that was sent them into the customer service centre, which the community officially opened. And of course, went up and she walked to one of, one of the, the, the staff on duty. And what do you do there? Well, ma'am, something's in for inquiry. I took on to the, the database find out the department of the person they need to talk to and, and get them to contact them. Well, that's fine. And over my shoulder, I hear this. Ah, 
But you play games on it and do what you're looking at. Put the Venom back. So that was just typical, you know, of, of the Duke of Edinburgh. But, but after that, um, Ross, we, we, we came to the, the final bit of the, the day. And this, this, this day will re remain me forever. Because I was a boy growing up in the Bow Farm and everybody knew, knew it as a house. And who'd have thought a, a boy for the schemes would one day become the promise of a midlife, which was probably the biggest thing ever happened to me. But we don't have a well scheme to meet Her Majesty the Queen. Sir, a lot has been said about the Queen. And the words I found, in my opinion, summed up the best. A long life dedicated to service. Thank you, Promise. Thank you. That's all. Thank you. That's all. Thank you, Provost. I'm uh, very happy to support the motion you put forward and your recommendation. Um, I, I'm going to take a long time here. If people don't mind, uh, I've allocated 25 minutes <laughs> of my valuable time to the memory of the magic. She had a, a lifetime of selfless service. Uh, she had a lifelong sense of duty and dedication to her people. In the midst of a rapidly changing and frequently troubled world, her calm and dignified presence has given us confidence to face the future as she did with courage and hope. On Sunday past, the King hosted what has been described as the diplomatic reception of the century at Nottingham Palace, with a thousand guests, including most world leaders. Mr. Joe Biden, in his address to our nation, said, we were fortunate to have had her for 70 years. We were very fortunate indeed, and she loved all of the world. She placed herself as a 21-year-old to the service of the nation. That service continued until the day before she passed. Brothers, for allowing me to say these few words, I thank you. God save the King. Thank you, Thomas. I just want to briefly associate myself with the new remarks in the context of this motion on behalf of my constituents in Gurur. And over the past two weeks have demonstrated the real high regard in which people across the different flights held Queen Elizabeth. And what struck me were the, the tributes that were left at the base of the Japanese cherry blossom tree um, in, in Gurur. And many people here will be familiar with that. Her Majesty the Queen actually planted in July 1958. And those tributes, which I went along to have a, a read of last week, they came from young and old and really um, focused above all else on the years of dedicated service the Queen gave to our country. And next year will be 65 years since she made that visit. And I'm hoping that the new King might consider visiting Europe to mark um, that occasion, hopefully after the coronation. And I'm sure many would welcome that. And just um, very finally, uh, Provost, I just want to acknowledge um, one other local aspect of, of last week, which was the two soldiers who were in her place were part of the um, Bearer Party accompanying the Queen's Coffin um, in Edinburgh. Port Glasgow's Scott Cox and Greenwich's Ryan McAllister, who both did our area and the country proud. And I'm sure everyone here would want to mark the important role that they played. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Boris. May I associate myself with your comments that have gone previously into your specific motion. Uh, the country mourned last week the, the passing of Queen Elizabeth II, or Elizabeth the Great, as some commentators are now starting to use, to see if that would sense. Uh, the royal family are still in a period of mourning, but my reflections since her death have been on the ties that she brought to history and to tradition. I, like many, well, apart from maybe yourself, sir, um, I, I never met the Queen. Um, the closest I got was the garden party at Hollywood House, and my wife and I attended the Golden Jubilee event in Buckingham Palace. So that was the closest we got to Her Majesty. But listening to commentators and people who did know her, she was dedicated to service, she was dedicated to family, and she had a sense of humour, which is something that the media didn't always tell us. Yes, she was our monarch, 
But she was a mother. She was a granddaughter. She was a great granddaughter. And I don't want to lose that context that she was a person. The ties to history and tradition have been played out on our television screens, many for the first time. And I've been fascinated, spent far too much time in front of a television screen over these past few weeks. But it may surprise you, it may surprise some of you, maybe even my colleague to in my right, it may surprise you to note that I don't see myself as a loyalist. I actually see myself as a constitutive monarchist, and there's a, there's a difference between a loyalist and a monarchist. But one tradition, one of the traditions that I am very thankful for, over the past two weeks, with the change of a prime minister and with the change of a monarch, with a gun being fired, with a woman being smashed. That's the tradition I want to stay with. God save the king. Also, Rops. Thank you, Provis. Um, I wanted to add a few comments today to the, the comments that have already been made. And I reflected on whether I wanted to say something new. And actually, I do feel that what I managed to scream for from a call in the Telegraph last week was exactly what I wanted to say. And so I'm going to do something that I never get a chance to do. So I'm hoping you'll indulge me, Provis, and let me read out loud some things that I merely read to myself and hope that everybody reads. I know you all did read it last week, but I'm going to ask you to really just listen to a few words and um, a summary of what I wrote um, at that point. My thoughts on what I came out complicated. My thoughts on the Queen. Like so. Service, dedication, wisdom and steadfastness are words that have been used to describe and define the Queen's 70 year reign. These qualities have been bountifully evident and they are indeed an inspiration. Even the qualities of Queen Elizabeth the four that I've mentioned, and many others, people who are around us. There are people in our community who serve faithfully, who are dedicated to causes and to other people, who bring wise counsel to bear whenever they speak, and who are steadfast in moving forward towards goals, despite whatever obstacles are there. Promised this opportunity to acknowledge the grief and loss within a family, which impacts the wider country and the wider world, makes me thankful for support services that we have locally. These are in place through our council and they're in complete abundance through the charitable and voluntary sectors locally. They're always there to help us carry the inevitable griefs and losses that we all experience in life. So at this time, when our own personal griefs are brought to mind through our collective experience, I would encourage people to speak with others, engage with support, and use a time of collective remembrance that we'll never see again as a remainder that we do our best work and we do it together and community. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Council members. Well, I'm happy to support Bob's McKenna's request. For the past two weeks, I personally have felt that Republicans have not been able to have a voice. So, as a Republican, I respectfully recognise and sympathise with the loss that Queen Elizabeth of Bristol Scotland's family must feel. As do thousands of families across our country who have lost their mums, grandmas, and great grandmas who have passed in desperate and tragic circumstances. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you. Uh, we go to Councillor Maguire, please. Thank you, Provost. I, I won't go on too much because a lot of people have already said what I was going to say. Um, I just wanted to pull out the, the servant heart that she had that I've just been talking about and the fact that this all came from her steadfast faith in God. I have found over the years her Christmas messages, which I never got brought up watching or anything like that. It was actually through going to university that somebody led me to actually start listening to them. But actually, as a person of faith, I found her very inspirational in that every year she tried to teach the nation something about Jesus and about God, and that I believe that that's where she got strength to serve right up until her final days. I think it's inspirational, as and we should all take from this the inspiration of that servant heart of us putting the needs of those that we that we represent before us making sure that we're doing the absolute best that we can and dedicating our life to serving those who have trusted us with their votes. 
I just want to say, I promise that I, I'd support your motion. Thank you, Councillor McGuire. Uh, Councillor Trevor. Councillor Crowder, are you still there? Yeah, the the second has indeed impacted history in a way that we can only see part of. Thank you, Provost. Thank you, Councillor Gann. Councillor Crowder. Thank you, um, Provost. Um, first of all, I welcome the request that you have made and would like to add that it was with, with great sadness that I heard of the passing of Her Majesty Elizabeth, Queen of Scots. I did offer my deepest condolence to King Charles III, the Queen Consort, and members of the wider royal family. Her Majesty was a, an inspirational woman, that goes without saying, and I associate myself with those who stated that she was a symbol of strength, compassion and commitment. She commanded respect and affection from millions of people across the, the globe throughout her 70 years reign, a reign devoted to life in the throne, and we should quietly reflect upon her unflinching commitment to decades of public service. I, like many others through Inverclyde, shared the grief of the royal family for the loss of a mother, grandmother, great-grandmother, and aunt to her extended family. Provost, I support your motion. Thank you, Councillor Powell. And finally, uh, Leader of the Council, Councillor McCann. Yeah, thank you, Provost. And thank you for bringing this request before the Council to allow us the opportunity to pay tribute to our late Majesty Queen Elizabeth. Of course, somebody might have pointed out Queen Elizabeth was the first of Scotland rather than the, the second. Um, Unfortunately, like, unlike Councillor Moran, I never got the chance to meet the Queen as she visited in Clyde. I was son myself in Mallorca at the time, having booked a family holiday in advance, silly me. Uh, but by all accounts, uh, I've heard over the last few weeks, and from uh, Councillor Moran, she was a, a lovely lady. But in terms of uh, serving our country, there is no doubt she was an exceptional head of state uh, who served our country with distinction for 70 years. And we will never see her life again. Absolutely never see her life again. And I offer my deepest condolences to King Charles and the rest of the, the royal family, because as others have uh, mentioned, uh, it's a family who've lost their, their mother, not just uh, us lo losing our head of state. Uh, King Charles, I think, has got off to a very good start, um, and hopefully he will learn from his mother, and if he's half as good uh, a monarch as his mother will, uh, was, our country will be very well served. And I would like also to echo your thanks to our staff for all the work that they put in, both in helping us recognise the Queen's passing, but also in the King's succession as well. I think there was exceptional work put in, and I'm very grateful for all the work they put in. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Councillor. <coughs> thank you, members, for all your uh, contributions there. Thank you so much. Uh, can we agree the recommendation? I think we can. Uh, the minutes of the meetings of uh, the Council and the various committees. Uh, the meeting of Inverclyde Council held on the 13th of June, pages 205 to 210. I will propose that that's a true and proper minute. Uh, is there anybody otherwise minded there? Uh, thank you. The, the general purpose of the board held on the 20th of July, 2022, page 211. Council Moran. Provost, I'll move this true record. Thank you. Is there anybody otherwise banquet? Thank you. The Human Resources Appeals Board, held on the 29th of July, uh, page 212. Council Brennan, please. Yes, I'll propose it. Thanks, Provost. Uh, is there anybody otherwise banquet? Thank you, Council Brennan. Uh, the Special Meeting of the Planning Board, held on the 3rd of August, uh, pages 213, 214. Councillor McVeigh, please. I move that's a true record, promise. Thank you. Is there anybody otherwise, man? Thank you. Uh, the local review body held in, uh, also on the 3rd of August, pages 215, 216. Councillor McVeigh? Yes, I move that's a true record, promise. Anybody otherwise, man? Thank you. Uh, the Policy and Resources Committee held on the 9th of August, pages 217 to 220. Councillor McVeigh? Yeah, I move that that's a true record, promise. Thank you. Is there anybody otherwise, man? Thank you. The Social Work and Social Care Scrutiny Panel, uh, held on the 18th of August, uh, pages 221 to 223, Councillor Jackson. Thank you. Is there anybody otherwise? Thank you. The Policy and Resources 
Executive Subcommittee uh, held on the 23rd of August, page 224. Councillor McCabe? Yeah, I'll move the minutes to two minutes, please. Thank you. Is there MD otherwise, my please? Thank you. Uh, the Environment and Regeneration Committee held on the 25th of August, pages 225 to 229. Uh, Councillor McCormick? Provost, if I may, can I bring members' attention to commend the reference D79 on page 226? Can I provide clarity that the decision includes the core bank of land between Hunter Terrace and the church run by Hunter Terrace? Just a clarification. Thank you, okay. Councillor McCormick. With these amendments, is the remedy otherwise minded? Thank you. Uh, the Education and Communities Committee held on the 30th of August. Uh, pages 230 to 234, Councillor Fogarty. Thank you, Councillor Fogarty. Is there anybody otherwise minded? The, the planning board held on the 7th of September, page 235. Uh, Councillor Curley, please. Move this is a true record, the provost. Thank you. Is there anybody otherwise minded? Thank you. And the local review body held on the 7th of September, uh, page 236. Councillor McVeigh, please. This is a true record, provost. Thank you. Is there anybody otherwise? Thank you. I declare all these minutes. Uh, yes. Item number four in, on the agenda is the future delivery of council meetings. Uh, Mr. Strachan, please. Thank you, Provost. Um, afternoon, uh, members. So, yeah, this report, uh, I've got a brief introduction. Uh, Council last considered this on 17 February. Uh, we've got to give the passage of time, subsequent um, council decisions, um, and the council has moved towards a more consistent working environment. It's appropriate for the council to review the current arrangements and resolve what we've been doing for us to provide clarity to elected members, officers, and members of the public. Um, essentially, there are three main elements to the report. Uh, firstly, to confirm how we're going to hold meetings going forward. Secondly, to um, advise council of the move away from WebEx and Microsoft Teams, and thirdly, to advise council that officers will be uh, undertaking a further assessment around potential upgrades to the chambers, including installation of a, um, a suitable video conferencing system. I wouldn't propose to say anything more about setting or third elements, but just briefly around the proposed continuation of hybrid meetings. Um, from an officer perspective, we believe this has been successful, hybrid meetings. To help keep elected members, officers, public safe whilst enabling good, efficient, effective conduct of meetings and effective use of officer time. Um, it is a different experience. We all acknowledge that, we accept that. Uh, we know there are different views on that. However, all taken into account, we do believe that meetings can still be operated efficiently and effectively through that, including the quasi judicial meetings. Um, and we also think adoption of hybrid meetings is consistent with the council approach to flexible working. Um, so there's various recommendations. I won't repeat those. I'm very happy to take any questions. Thank you. Is there any questions for Mr. Strachan? Councillor Wilson, please. Thank you. Thank you, Provost. Um, it's my intention today, colleagues, to ask for your support for a motion or an amendment to the agenda item to a quasi-judicial bodies held in person and not remotely. The exception to that is the licensing board and councillor groups would have to discuss that separately with the licensing board, which is separate from the council. In terms of the papers, if we look at recommendation number, number 2.1, from the first bullet point, I would exclude quasi-judicial boards from that. Other meetings to be held on a hybrid basis, but not quasi-judicial bodies. I think even today we have some of the sound there from contributions, and the sound from this is not great. If we are talking about having considering voting on somebody's business, their employment, or their house, we should do this in person. I don't think the quality is good enough yet of WebEx for it to be done remotely and for us to be voting remotely. I think we need to be in here with the person in front of us so we can see who's voting for it. I thank um, Mr. Strachan for his advice he's given me. Um, and I shall come on to that in a minute, Mr. Strachan. You've been most polite with me. 
Yes. So, uh, in general purposes yesterday, um, most members were in the chamber. There's one particular where Councillor Curley led a discussion on the car accident that happened a few years ago because he knew where the location was. He was able to talk very, very eloquently about it and you could gauge the reaction of the applicant from what Councillor Curley was saying. Also, Councillor Moran was in a position to say, and he's done it before, to, um, to applicants, ask them, how important is your job to you? Do you have another job? He was able to ask questions like that, which in person really work and give you an impression of what the, 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 the body language of the applicant is with what he's thinking. It was really um, very, very important to do this in person. Uh, Mr. Strachan sent me an email and a quote. He said to me, it's not competent for my motion to be brought forward because of the Coronavirus Recovery and Reform Act Scotland 2022. Colleagues, coronavirus is gone, the pandemic is gone. Even Joe Biden's standing up and saying, we don't have a pandemic any longer. And we are still going on, putting forward policy and legislation based on something that was happening well over a year ago. We really do need to move forward. So, in essence, in conclusion, I'm asking you to support that amendment that I put forward that for the future, for advising judicial bodies, we do them in person. I think, Mr. Strachan, you may have a caveat to that. Thank you, Corpus. Thank you, Councillor Wilson. Uh, Councillor Strachan. Uh, Mr. Strachan. <laughs> 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 Right, I promise, yes. Okay. Yeah, have your money. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, uh, Councillor Wilson, and uh, we've had a discussion about it. So, I mean, I suppose a couple of things. Uh, Polly, firstly, um, I did acknowledge that in the report that we do understand that there's differing views on this, and I do understand the point the Councillor makes in terms of some of the decisions and being able to get a better, perhaps, judge of the situation in front of, of members and what are difficult decisions. However, I do think that can still be dealt with effectively, efficiently through hybrid or even remote meetings. Um, I'll come on to the legislation, but we know that courts operate on that basis, the employment tribunals operate on that basis. Um, the act in question um, is law, um, it's about to come into force with other provisions, and it will be on the statute book. And just so members are aware, I don't want to bore them with legalese, but effectively, the provisions relate to the holding of hearings for civic licensing and liquor licensing matter, matters and provide that uh, when determining how a hearing is to be held, uh, a licensing authority must take account of any views given on the issue or by any person who notifies the authority of an intention to participate in the hearing. And because of that, I think there would be some risk if there was a blanket position that we had to have um, all participants in the chamber. Uh, and that would be my concern. I think maybe that Councillor Wilson from discussion with you, you weren't seeking that members of the public had to be in the chamber, but only elected members? Only elected members. Only elected members. Um, so, um, so, so that's an important clarification. Um, I think, that, however, that I, from my perspective as legal advisor to the council, I would be concerned with the risk of decisions that have been found or being said to be unlawful. And um, I would be concerned that we might have situations where members were otherwise not able to attend meetings, perhaps they declared an interest, perhaps they planning the site, they hadn't attended the site visit, so they then couldn't take part. We might be up against it in terms of time risk of deemed refusal, that I fear we would end up in a situation where um, it might not meet our needs to be so prescriptive. Um, certainly my preference and advice to members would be that we don't carve out quasi-judicial meetings, and that we're able to have those on a hybrid basis as well. Um, if members were minded that they wish to be able to have or wish to have a position that elected members uh, should be in the chamber for quasi judicial meetings, then I think we can stipulate it's the planning board, the local review board, and general purposes board, and um, so the elected members, and that is safe, safe where required by law. Um, 
or otherwise missed by the chair and subject to the other elements of the council's decision making uh, decision today, because I think we need to allow for flexibility around future spikes in COVID and other eventualities. I'm happy to take any further questions or go into any further detail. I would be happy with that. Thank you, Mr. Shrampton. Uh, Council Brown? Thanks, uh, Mr. Provost. So um, I'm seeking to support the recommendations of the paper. COVID had a terrible impact on society and the economy, and will probably continue to do so for a long, long time to come. But a phrase that we sometimes hear is keep the good stuff, and I believe that one of these good stuffs is hybrid meetings and work like school ways of working particularly good for people with caring responsibilities, really important for women. And I think it's another way to bring that diversity that we all wish to see in the council and amongst our elected members. Thank you, Councillor Brennan. Councillor McKay. Yeah, um, subject to Mr Strachan and Councillor Wilson agreeing their amendment, um, I'm intending to move the recommendations in the report, and I'm sure Councillor Brennan will second that, I'm sure one of my colleagues. We did have a discussion at the Strategic Leadership Forum about this particular paper, and uh, so it's no surprise that Councillor Wilson is moving an amendment, but the, you, the view of everybody else at the Strategic Leadership Forum was that the high model it works well for the reasons that Councillor Brennan has articulated, except with a few of my group that interested in our hybrid model for all meetings. So, as I say, I'm prepared to move the recommendation. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Councillor McKay. Um, Mr. Jason. Thanks, Provost. Um, first of all, if, if coronavirus is done, then somebody better tell my boss because he's had it for three days and he's been off work with it. So let him know. Um, secondly, I think I totally agree with Councillor Brennan. I think we were pushed into this. It, it, it came upon us by happenstance and we've found something that really does work. And it's not just the council that's using it. Every business has had to use this because of the fact this hybrid work and pushed upon them. So I think for people with responsibilities, people that have childcare issues and people that have other things to do, I think it's really important that we stick with it. So I would totally agree with Councillor Brennan on that. Thank you, Councillor Brennan. I'm getting Councillor McVeigh. Yes, thank you, Provost. Uh, as the Chair of the Planning Board, uh, I, I share some of Councillor Wilson's concerns. However, in general, they have worked quite well. Uh, we have had members of the public in the chamber who, who are interested in, in the, what items are on the agenda. We have had votes and it's generally went quite well. On balance for me, I, I think Mr Strachan makes a good point uh, regarding the future spreads in COVID, which Councillor Daisy has addressed is still with us. Uh, not to the same extent, but it's still here and I think we have to make plans and provide for that. So on balance, I would support the recommendation in the report. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor McVeigh. Uh, Councillor Murphy, please. Uh, Maguire, sorry. No, that's okay. Thank you, Provost. Um, just to echo some of what's already been said, I agree with Councillor Daisley. COVID is very much still amongst us. It's not going away. It's still important that we wash our hands and stay home if we're ill. I agree with what Councillor Brennan said. Something good has came out of the terrible situation that we found through COVID. <laughs> and I can understand some of Councillor Wilson's concerns. I think, broadly speaking, they have worked well with the meetings. And hopefully with us potentially moving to teams, that should provide some, some further stability. I think that this radical change has only come about because we were really pushed into it. And I think it would be immense of us to go back to the way. So I think that hybrid works well. It will hopefully, as the years in the councils change, it will encourage younger people to stand for council. It will encourage those people who maybe are, are housebound or less able to travel about to stand. And hopefully it will encourage people who maybe have, have busy lives, otherwise whether they're caring or maybe they've got children or whatnot, hopefully it will encourage more people to engage in our democracy here. And um, so I fully support the recommendations in this paper. Thank you, Councillor Maguire. Uh, I'm getting the feeling, members, of an overall uh, satisfaction with the system that's working. Uh, I take completely what... Councillor Wilson has said, and said very eloquently about the advantages of being in the chamber for uh, a quasi-judicial meeting. And I think we cannot disagree with Councillor Wilson. The, the body language does tell you a lot, and I would hope that if you are able to attend a quasi-judicial meeting in person, then it's advantageous to do so. I, I can put this to a vote. Uh, 
if you like, I think you know what we would go. I, I would ask uh, Councillor Wilson, would you consider withdrawing your amendment on the fact that you've had a good hearing and uh, I think people know it. You're, and I'd probably agree with you on the, on the, the quasi judicial side of things. I actually promised my, uh, my young assistant, Gagging, <laughs> to second my motion. Um, he's had very little opportunity in his time as a councillor to, to second the motion with full council. And I think we should allow him that little question. <laughs> Thank you, Provost. Thank you, Councillor Wilson. Uh, before I go to Councillor Brooks, uh, mm -hmm. Councillor Moran. I thank you, Prof. I'm, I'm sorry, you know, it's been late. Prof. I, I fully understand where Council Wilson is coming from. And you're sitting on that chair, you Prof. and you're quoting this, and especially for general purposes. When people turn up to the meeting, they give you an insight to what a person is. You, you, know, you, you know that they're genuine, and sometimes maybe not genuine, but you, you, you're given that opportunity to speak to a person. And it sometimes does sway your opinion. They, they come in here, you look at the record, you read it, and then you start talking to the individual, and it's a completely different person who wrote down that, that paper. But having said that, uh, Provost, I was very reluctant when we started this WebEx stuff. I was one of the dinosaurs, which we need to win the, the chamber. And, and so what we don't apologize to that, but I came to, to like the WebEx system. And I can give you one example when I was sitting on the Cosla when I had to get a chain at 10 past 7 in the, the morning to go through to Edinburgh for a meeting that started at half past 10. It lasted an hour, back on the train because I don't have to end lunch, back to Greenham, half past 3 in the afternoon. I did a day out of my life for a meeting that lasted an hour. But with, with the teams in the WebEx, it was so much better. My colleagues from Shetlands, Highlands, Highlands, used to need to stay the night in Edinburgh for a meeting that lasted an hour and a bit. So, although I agree with what Councillor Olsen is saying, I think this system working now is far superior to anything that I've ever worked in my time in Council. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Olsen. Yeah, thank you, my promise. I just, I'm not too sure people are saying that Councillor Olsen spoke very eloquently and said what he said. I didn't I say that. I didn't say that. But a bit confused, and we're not suggesting the cause that was back to face to face meetings. But we're, we're not suggesting that people who are unwell should come into the chamber. Whether it's a COVID 19 SARS or whether it's a bonnet plague of a cold, you know, but we're not suggesting that people from the chamber who are clearly not well. Surely that's always been the case. That if they're not well, they stay home. The phase of um, coronavirus is over, and also it's been charming, I do understand that. We have also an endemic virus within a culture. Um, it's no longer the pandemic, the WHO's chief the line of what it is and what it isn't, and, and that's the physiology that the council also be using. So we have an endemic virus, but we're all going to have it in our bodies, we're all going to have, have it on us. I don't know how many sanitizing hands they're in, but you have it on your hands. But the challenge is that through the vaccine programme, through the, the it's, it, it immunity that we've developed, and so that there'll be a different reaction to what it was our body two years ago. So, so that, that's the fact that we've moved on. Nobody wants to move back. We have to accept that coronavirus is a, 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 is a endemic virus that's with us. And yes, let's take the good things we've learned. Let's you know, run positive in meetings um, on WebEx or whatever platform they choose um, to ensure that we're not losing a day of our life traveling to Edinburgh for an hour's meeting. But that's not, that's not what's been put before us. What's been put before us is the justice element of taking some of these taxi licenses or some of these plan applications, uh, you know, taking something away so we can see them face to face. I know I was sitting in the general purpose board, but I did in the previous council. It was so important. It was so important to actually see that individual and understand where they were coming from. And they, you also, you felt accountable. When you were actually when you're sitting around this table. Um, some members even on video of these boards put their videos off. So the, 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 the gentleman or the lady who's who's been signed upon, his career has been designed, he can see the face of the person who's voted for or against. So so there are a number of challenges. So what, what we actually had was a motion put forward, we had a legal advice given some background, some understanding, and I thought we had a sort of 
together some lines between kind of Sir Wilson uh, and Mr. Strachan. But just in case that's not the case, Provis, I'm happy to say the motion. Thank you, Councillor Brooks. Uh, I see in the chat Councillor Maguire wishes to, oh, she's withdrawn her supplementary comment. That's right. Uh, Mr. Strachan, we have a motion here uh, as per written in the agenda, uh, proposed by uh, Councillor McCabe and seconded by Councillor Brennan. And we have an amendment that is proposed by Councillor Wilson and seconded by Councillor Brooks. Well, it was good to yeah, thank you. I think, I think maybe strictly speaking, um, Councillor Wilson was on the, sort of the, the floor first, so probably his is the, his is the motion. Can I just check? Do you want to, as, as you table it or with the incorporation of that? Those so, incorporation of your okay, okay, that's fine. Um, seconded by Councillor Brooks and then Councillor um, Brennan, seconded by Councillor. Okay, was it? Yeah, we're happy to do that. <laughs> okay, all right, thank you. So we'll go to the vote, if we may. The uh, motion is Councillor Wilson. Councillor Wilson, motion, yes. So if you could ask for your uh, vote for or against for not voting in respect of the motion by Councillor Wilson or the amendment by Councillor Brennan. So, um, Councillor Armstrong. Amendment. Councillor Brennan. Amendment. Councillor Brooks. Motion. Councillor Cassidy. Amendment. Councillor Fogarty. Amendment. Councillor Crowder. Amendment. Councillor Turley. <coughs> Amendment. Councillor Daisley. Amendment. Councillor Jackson. Amendment. Councillor Law. Amendment. Councillor McKay. Amendment. Councillor McCluskey. Amendment. Councillor McCormick. Amendment. Councillor McClark. Amendment. Provost McKenzie. Amendment. Councillor McBaith. Amendment. Councillor Moran. Amendment. Councillor Nelson. Motion. Councillor Quinn. Amendment. Councillor Reynolds. Amendment. Councillor Robertson. Amendment. And Councillor Wilson. Motion. So the amendment is carried by 19 votes to 3. Thank you, Mr. Sharkin. Uh, I thank you also for the proposals and second report of the, uh, the motion and the amendment. And I think no matter the result here, I think people have taken board the words of Councillor Wilson and Councillor Brooks as far as attendance at the Fuzzy Judicial Meeting. So, uh, the next item on the agenda is the flag flying protocol, which is on page 11 of your agenda. Uh, Mr. Strachan. No. Okay, and um, thank you, Provis. Uh, yeah, so the purpose of this report is very important. It was a uh, live line to call for this council meeting on the 17th of February. Um, as we stated in there, the council doesn't have, doesn't have a, a formal position on flags. So, so the year, but in fact, a number of specific council decisions, including a couple that I've given examples of in the report. So we're proposing that a flag post call is um, adopted by clarity around this, given uh, recent, recent circumstances, which of course, uh, as you dealt with today, we've updated it as well to reflect that, and also uh, asking, uh, recommending that officers in consultation with board five councillors look at uh, the possibility of alternative locations for a flag pole within Europe. Uh, so I'm also looking for a confirmation that the council continues to fly the Ukrainian flag. Happy to take any questions. Uh -huh. Can we agree the flag flying protocol, members? Agreed. Agreed. Uh, Councillor Brennan. Thanks very much, Provost. Um, so the report stated that some flags can be contentious. So I was surprised to see that Empire Day was in the list of occasions when flags are to be flown. That my understanding from some um, point. Brief research following that was that Empire Day had been superseded by Commonwealth Day in 1958, and both Commonwealth Day and Empire Day are both listed here. That unless we were continuing to fly out the Empire Day flag here in Inverclyde to mark some of the wrongdoing associated with Empire, then I was wanting to request some more information about why it is going. Um, so I would like to have that information and also perhaps see Empire Day being removed from the list that I think it's no longer really necessary for it to be celebrated. 
for the more ethical reasons and also just simply for the practical reasons that I don't think it's a day that is marked widely either in the UK or beyond. Thank you, Thank you. Brennan. Uh, Mr. Strachan, you have to say. Thank you for that. Um, yes, and when we brought this list forward, this is, I suppose, the list, as I said, developed over customer practices over some period of time. I think you might be right in that that's, that position has been adopted elsewhere. I suppose what we do is bring it forward saying that this is what officers have been working to. It's entirely within the gift of, of council if they wish to decide something different. And as I was just looking there, uh, the Scottish Government will be in. We and um, local authorities don't need to follow their guidance for their flying of flags. Um, I suppose we sort of kind of take a bit of a, a benchmark to see what they do, and, and they don't fly the uh, the Empire flag. Um, but I don't know if that exists, but I have to take other questions on that. Does anybody else wish to contribute to this? Uh, I think what Councillor Brennan said is, uh, is most sensible. Can we agree the recommendations uh, with further consideration to be taken with the the Empire flag and the Empire theme. Can I, can I just... Uh, sorry, first, I was just going to say, if that's the decision today, then um, I would probably just, just score it out. And then if members wish to add that in or do any other change that I'll let that would be a decision of the council. Yeah. So rather than us bring something back. That's yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, the Empire was not all bad. Um, the Empire <coughs> brought many good things all over the world to many, many countries. And the countries that were in the Empire, the vast majority of you have moved to being in the Commonwealth. If we are going to do anything here, I would suggest we have a, replace it with another day with a Commonwealth flag. And have the Commonwealth flag flying twice within the, uh, within the year, if that is the wish of our colleagues. Um, but I don't think we should be disparaging totally the Empire for all the wrong reasons. Does anybody have any objection to what Councillor Wilson has proposed there? Councillor Clough. Yeah. yeah, so we have the Commonwealth, sorry, Provost, we have the Commonwealth flying fly in Commonwealth Day. Yeah. yeah. Do, do we need to fly any other day? So we we'll fly the Commonwealth flag in the Commonwealth Day. That makes sense. So you'd want the same flag for an empire day. <clears throat> Just a compromise, that's the problem. You don't need compromise. So I, I would think we just fly the, the, the flag in the Commonwealth Day. I think that's more than enough. And for the empire day that's marked on the proposals here, what do we do? Do we take that off altogether? Yeah, yes. yes. We remove it. Yes. Is there anybody otherwise minded? I'm less otherwise minded. Promise that you you don't mind. So we have a situation where we used to fly the Union flag all the time here. That has been replaced by the Saltire, which is a flag that's been uh, taken by the Scottish Nationalist Party and used as their symbol. And we took away the Union flag there. I don't think we can take the Union flag away from another occasion where it flies on this day and an So I still maintain that. Going to do it with another Commonwealth Day flag which follows on from the Empire. With the Empire, then with the Commonwealth. There is a continuity there. And Thank that you would be your motion, Councillor Yeah. Do you have a seconder? I have a second. Thank you, Councillor Brooks. And the amendment is that we remove it from it altogether. Councillor mm -hmm. Property and Al Kramer. Uh, and I would second that. Uh, can we take that to a vote? Yes. So um, I think I was going to say a promise ever made that I think um, Councillor Brennan was in first with a motion of moving the recommendations in the report subject to the deletion of the Empire flag and the Empire Day and that nothing would be flowed in its place. It would be seconded by Councillor Fogarty um, and Councillor Wilson uh, for an amendment that on <coughs> Empire Day, though we said we have the Commonwealth flag flowed on that day, seconded by Councillor Brooks. So, yep. Should I go to the Councillor Brennan's motion? Yep, should I go to the vote? So yes, it's the vote by Councillor Brennan, uh, the amendment by uh, Councillor Wolfs. So, Councillor Armstrong, motion or amendment? Motion. Councillor Brennan? Motion. Councillor Brooks? Amendment. Councillor Casting? Motion. Councillor Property? Motion. Councillor Crowder? Motion. Councillor Crowley? Motion. Councillor Daisley? Motion. 
Councillor Jackson. Motion. Councillor Law. Motion. Councillor McKay. Motion. Councillor McCluskey. Motion. Councillor McCormick. Motion. Councillor McGuire. Motion. Motion. Sorry. The promise. McKenzie. Motion. Councillor McVeigh. Motion. Councillor Moran. Motion. Councillor Nelson. Motion. Motion. Councillor Quinn. Motion. Councillor Reynolds. Motion. Councillor Robertson. Motion. Councillor Wilson. Oh, amendment. So uh, the motion is carried by 19 votes to 3. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, members. Uh, agenda number agenda. item number six on page seventeen is uh, a motion entitled "The Cost of Living Emergency." Uh, it's a motion by Councillor Maguire. Uh, Councillor Maguire, please. Thank you, Provost. I, I won't read out everything that's within the motion because I'm sure you've all had time to read it. All the information and it was correct at the time of me submitting the motion. Um, but I just want to start by acknowledging the progress that has been made and that some of the interventions that the UK, Scottish and even our local authorities have been doing and some of the and thank our officers for the interventions that they've identified so far. The Scottish Government has announced, I believe it was last week, rent freezes and that they put a temporary stop to evictions. They've announced that there'll be a train fare freeze. The UK Government themselves has introduced a lower energy cap for domestic customers. However, with it not being 3,549, we seem to be forgetting that it's still increasing by over £500 in October. The UK government earlier this year introduced a £150 rebate on council tax. And we decided as a local authority here with many of the members that got re-elected agreeing to give almost 10,000 households an extra £200 towards their off their bills. We did three place schemes across the summer. The UK government yesterday announced a six-month relief period through the NJ Bill relief scheme for charities, businesses and public sector. However, I believe that more still needs to be done. More needs to be done to provide mm -hmm. relief to our constituents and businesses. And whilst I'm grateful that some action has been taken, we have people that were struggling to eat and heat their homes before this crisis became what it has now become. Situation has been exasperate, has exasperated everybody's living situation. So I would call on all of my colleagues around this table to support the motion here, which is asking us to write Scottish and UK governments to ask for what more can be done and to ask our officers to look for even more solutions to try and ease what is facing every constituent and every business in this area. And I'll pass the councillor clock to, to second this motion. Thank you, Councillor McGuire. Councillor Clark. Yeah, thanks, Provost, uh, and thanks, Natasha, for bringing the motion to, to the Council. Uh, I wouldn't take that long. I mean, at the last full Council meeting, we actually passed, we noted the cost of living crisis when we were doing the free um, place schemes. So we noted at that point in time, we all know what's happening out in our, our, our communities, um, and we know come the winter time, our communities are really going to suffer. Now, we know what's been happening as well, both from the UK government and from the Scottish government, but really, we don't know what's ahead of us, and we're worried. I think everybody around this table is worried. They're worried in so much that we're talking about, as a council, we're talking about, do we open up our community centres for keen? Do we open up our libraries for keen? Do we let people in? Do we open up our schools to allow um, people to use our washing machines and our dryers? What do we actually do as a council? We're doing this, but yet we've got 15, pound, 15 million pounds of worth of cuts to go for in the next two years. We're getting our legs cut away with it when we're trying to help our communities. Now, there's no use name blaming. I would have to say rather than saying that, I was listening to um, Jacob Street Small, one of my favourite politicians, the other day there when he actually said, this government's only been in for two weeks, right? And he said, no, let's take a step back, right? Let's take a step back. The current Conservative government have been in charge since 2010. Although they've done a revolving door of 10 down the street, it's still the same people. They've just changed their jackets. So when we look at that, and we look to see what Germany is doing, that's heavy reliant 
on Russian supply of gas. Um, and we see that their bills are increasing by 20%, and yet the UK is increasing by a hell of a lot more than that. We look at Germany and we say, right, OK, they've recognised the failure in the capitalist system and they've went to look to nationalise our gas companies. And then we look to see what the UK has done. And we actually say, well, hold on. We've papered over the cracks for six months. But we're still going to be in winter in six months' time. When we're waiting for trickle-down trickle economics in Greenock, it will be like rain. Eventually it will reach our feet, but it's got a long way to come before it does that. And the second um, Council um, Maguire's um, motion, it's just a chance for us as councillors to say, we are extremely frustrated. New councillors must be extremely frustrated. We're going into difficult, hard, hard budget rounds. When we're getting asked to cut our services from the people who really need that out in our, our, our areas. And what we, the only thing we can do to show our frustration is right to both Nicholas Sturgeon and um, Theresa. No. Oh, Liz first. Sorry, <laughs> that, that was the thing. It's a change. 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 To, to make sure that but I think wording is important. I'm not going to ask the men to wording, but wording is important. So six months, as the title says, two years is a cap, not, not, not six months. Also, we have the reality that in here we've got people starving to freeze to death. Well, the last thing that was used was over um, 10,000 hits on social media platforms. That, that phrase was obviously taken and obviously read by people on social media. But when it was fact checked, it was actually untrue. And the details are very much available that we don't have 30,000 British pensioners freezing to death. That was the phrase that was fact checked. What we had, we had uh, 25,260 people, and since the last year, since this were available, that were having, uh, that had died, which was excess death, but was due to flu, incident, uh, flu and various other winter diseases and domestic colds. So I, I was just, I just wanted to say to our uh, Tasha's on the screen, uh, into German Resource Sector, that the phrase that people will starve and freeze to death has been fact checked and not true. And to continue to be using lines like that, it maybe helps get points across, but if it's not true, I don't think it's helpful. But nevertheless, we're not going to go for a vote. We're not going to go for a vote, was it, to 19 uh, We're not going to go for 22 this time. We're happy to, two letters to written to the appropriate leaders of the Scottish Government and the Prime Minister. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Brooks. Thank you, Provost. I had some, I had some notes prepared here, but I just wanted to address uh, Councillor Brooks' point first off. Like, you know, we're in a position today, just today, where the National Registers of Scotland has said the life expectancy in this country has gone back again. And so, you know, it might, it might not be that you can draw a line directly from people being cold to people dying, but you can certainly draw a line between people in poverty and people dying. And that, that's what the National Register of Scotland said today. People are dying earlier because they are poor. So in a, in a, so in a, in a, in a situation <laughs> in a situation where our country is facing, and our community is facing probably one of the worst situations in terms of poverty that we face in peacetime, we are going to see, see people freeze and starve to death. But the scale of the response that we've seen from both the UK and I've got to say as well the Scottish government just isn't sufficient. So we have the idea of a cap on energy prices of two and a half thousand pounds. That's it's not a cap, it's an increase. The government are mandating bill increases from from one thousand five hundred pounds last year to two and a half thousand pounds this October. In one year, an increase of over a thousand pounds, 108 um, percent. And the only people actually benefiting from that. So what they've done is they've increased our bills, they've put in a cap of two and a half thousand pounds, they've said we're going to keep it there for two years, whether the price goes up or down. And the only people benefiting from that are shareholders of oil and gas companies who are benefiting from Putin's war abroad and from poor people suffering here in this country. And from the Scottish Government last year, we had support that was only £15 a month for most families. And the decision, as my colleague Beverly did to a moment ago, to 
only increase council budgets by 0.93% over the course of the next three years, while their own budget increases by 12%, is ridiculous, it's ludicrous. And it's forcing us to make cuts that are going to, that are going to hit the poorest people in this community um, the hardest. And I would ask members of the city if they're going to make remarks as to, to answer the question, why when the Scottish Government budget is increasing by 12%, why are we only seeing council budgets increasing by 0 093 it's in, it's in the Scottish Government's resource spending review. You can check it on your phones before you stand up and uh, give an answer. I just want to share a few stories that have been shared with me over the last week, and maybe this will also speak to um, Councillor Brooks' point. Um, one woman who relies on a car to get to work every day has seen her fuel increase from £15 to more than £35 a week. That's just to get to her work. At a time when she's counting every penny, not every pound, every penny to make ends meet. Um, another told me she's now working two jobs seven days a week, and even doing that, she's still having to choose to skip meals in order to feed her child. Another said that she's taking a family, this one, this one had the, the worst. She's, this woman was taking her family out on walks at night in the dark, wearing their warmest coats because she didn't want to stay inside and keep her appliances on, her television, her um, heating on, um, because she couldn't afford to run them. These are there are Victorian conditions that we're facing in 2022, so I welcome the action the council is taking. We are doing as much as we possibly can, whether it's the warm boxes or the um, or the warm hand of friendship um, programs that we signed off earlier um, this week. And last year, we went even further by providing £350 to the poorest families in our community, which was more than the Scottish government did at that time. Um, so my plea today is that for people here who have both the ears of the UK and the Scottish Government, the ears of First Ministers, Prime Ministers, members of the Cabinet, that they are the ones that have the powers to make a difference. They are the ones that can, can do that, and they have to ask. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor McCluskey. Uh, Councillor Long? Thank you, Tovis. Um, I would first like to welcome the acknowledgement of Brexit by our local Labour group. Uh, as a contributory factor in this emergency we now face with regards to the cost of living, despite the UK uh, Labour national policy of not rejoining. I wholeheartedly support plans to work cross-party with the local MP and MSP to lobby the Scottish and UK governments to increase the level of funding for Inverclyde, which I'm sure we all hope has a successful outcome. Uh, this is why I'm happy to accept the motion. Um, just with regards to... Uh, Councillor McCluskey's last statements. I understand we are elected members and we all around this table, including every one of us in the SNP group, want more money from our life. We will lobby every chance we get, we can assure you. Any Scottish National Party member of government that we speak to, we are speaking to them about this and we will continue to do so. But we have to realise that the Scottish Government are spending so much money mitigating the absolute disastrous policies of the UK Government, yeah. including yeah. the bedroom tax, two child cap. We're now having to increase the Scottish child payment just to bring down poverty levels in Scotland, which outperforms the rest of the UK in these matters. Thank you. Yes, Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Jackson. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. No, I mean, it's worth remembering this cost of living emergency predates uh, and then it will never take claim. Uh, it's been a, a reality for the majority of in the place, poorest communities for over 10 years now. Uh, it was no national emergency uh, when benefits were getting cut. It was no national emergency when food banks and charities were stepping in uh, where the welfare state is failing. Uh, this is an emergency because of the number of people affected and the rising demand uh, and the limited resources and continuing budget cuts we've faced for the last 10 years. So, whatever support is provided, I think we need to remember uh, the reality that uh, for many, after the support comes in, uh, if this balance is out, the many workers, pensioners, uh, and unemployed people and everything will still experience uh, poverty uh, well after. Uh, whatever the emergency powers can send to support us, but it's worth remembering that Enterprise Group has been dealing with this for over 10 years. Yeah. And I can also add, this is with just the police, so as this was other 
you know, parties that are involved. They've got in the support and benefit because it's sanctioned as well. So, probably... Thank you, Councillor Jackson. Is there anybody else? Councillor Robertson. Thank you, Provost. And it was with Councillor Jackson's comment I think that, that notion of the, the, the long term, the, the kind of almost generational issue that it's facing here is a real strong case for why we have to embrace the notion of the Everglade Task Force that's been set up, which is something that we can use our levers or our, our voices across the different spheres of government in quite a formal and targeted way for Everglade to, to address that, not just this acute issue now, but the chronic issue that's been faced by too many people in our community for far too long. Councillor McVeigh and Councillor McCluskey earlier on in the week laid out a challenge to us as SNP members in terms of, of using our voice to um to, to lobby hard um, for, for for a better settlement for local government for more funding to local government when we talked with our Scottish government colleagues and, and I said at the time it'll be repetitive again for I think promise that, that I did accept that challenge as leader of our group, not only at the time when it was given to me the other day, but it's something that I have already been doing as councillor councillor law says. And again I'm just going to put an, an offer across the table that again another area where we do have voices um, and our colleagues, our Labour colleagues who are in administration and who are around the COSA tables, because well, that's the kind of a, a formal link between local government and, and Scottish government. And again, I've accepted the challenge on behalf of my party, other members of my party have, have voiced the acceptance of that challenge. And I'm just putting the, the offer across the table just again when we've got COSA voices where we can speak on behalf of Labour in that forum and on behalf of this sphere of government in that forum, which we can't do because we're not in administration. Um, just that, again, that offer to to, to, to share with us on that challenge in particular forum. Thank you, Provost. Thank you, Councillor Robertson. Is there anybody else wishing to contribute before I go back to Councillor Maguire to sum up her motion? Councillor Maguire. Thank you, Provost. Um, I just want to just wrap my summing up, just um, come back to some of the points that we made today. So the the end of bill relief scheme that I was talking about, Councillor um, Brooks, that for businesses, that's for six months. The cap that's been put in place, which as has been quite rightly noted, is still a 500, over a 500 pound increase for everybody. That is for two years, but it's still an increase. But for businesses, it's only six months of relief that they're given to businesses, charities and public sector organisations. Our budget gap definitely does and has limited what we can do. And I, I accept Council Robertson's challenge of being co-productive with our colleagues in Hollywood and Westminster, which is what we're trying to do here. And with Hollywood, we will do anything that we can to ensure that we're getting the best possible outcomes for people in this area. To say that only 216 or 60, I couldn't quite um, detect if it's 16 or 60, to say that only that number of people have died cold is disgraceful. When we look at drug deaths, 16 is too many. 216 or 60, whichever it may be, is too many. The Scottish Public Health Office has said that premature mortality in Scotland is 20% higher than the rest of the UK. Yes, we had people who couldn't eat and couldn't heat their homes before this, but this situation has exacerbated it. And the insurmountable increase in bills will affect not just those who were vulnerable before, but will affect even more people. It is our duty as councillors for this area to ensure that those who are vulnerable are being helped to the best of our ability. And I do hope that that olive branch that has been uh, given out to us from the SNP will be accepted on both sides and that we will work with them, get the best possible outcomes. With Brexit, I did mention Brexit here, yeah, Brexit has impacted every area of our lives. That does not mean that I'm pro or against Brexit. I'm not going to bring that okay. into this conversation. Councillor McGuire, can I just tell yes. you that? Could you just finish your summing up without introducing anything else? And just sum up what's been discussed during okay, the Sorry, I was meeting. responding to okay. what people had said. Apologies. Um, okay. So we need help. We need help from the Scottish Government. We need help from the UK Government. And we need our officers to continue doing the job that they have of trying to find more spaces and more areas that we can help our constituents. Our budget cut of £15 million over the next couple of years is going to really minimise what we can do. It's disgraceful that we are people that are freezing and that will go to bed tonight and tomorrow and next week hungry. 
it is terrible that we are looking at heating banks. We're looking at things like that in 2022. This affects everyday people like me, like you, like our grandparents, our children, our constituents. I ask all my colleagues here today to support my motion to try and create a, a better tomorrow for the people of our area. Thank you, Provost. Thank you, Councillor Maguire. Uh, members, I'm reading the, the meeting as in everybody in agreement that a letter be sent to uh, both the Holyrood government and the Westminster government. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you for thank you for your your debate, uh, which was uh, most interesting and, and uh, very eloquent indeed uh, by most. Thank you so much. Uh, item number seven in the agenda is brought by Councillor Cassidy regarding Wednesday Station. Councillor Cassidy, please. Thank you, Provis. Hey, I hope you and the members will indulge me for a bit as this is my first motion to council. Or probably something you want to be worth I represent, but I also live in. But it's also something positive to remember how we've been several times after the last Saturday weeks. Wednesday Station is undoubtedly one of Britain's finest architectural events. It was built in 1865 two platforms in the Tennessee Reverse. Back then, the building was a growing fellow cell building designed to talk many large and how old it's been built in the Scarborough, but also in Wednesday. Back when the station first opened, the one main line was advertised being superior to the line which they are framing, as all the carriages contained seats. <laughs> the inaugural 1865 service provided four trains daily to the city, putting Wednesday within an hour of Glasgow and within 17 minutes of Munich. With all the trains being 18 carriages long. First class ticket costs about three and six, that's about 22 p. And a third class ticket costs two shillings, that's about 10 p. My go along to those days where real travel was that cheap. It would not be until after the opening uh, of the station five years later in 1870 that the first steamer service would run in association with the railway. By the 19th century, when uh, the pier provided ferry services to large parts of Adam. Milford, Warks, and Ellen, Rossi, and the Hells of you. The number of passengers trying to get through the train to the boat led to frequent misconnections, not to mention poor physical discomfort and poor weather. Coupled with the popularity of holidays in the Clyde being so great, the Caledon Wheel Company had to plan for considerable expansion of facilities. In 1903, the near Warden Sale building was designed by James Miller, the Caledon Railway Company's own architect as well. The building that we all come to know and love today. It was built in Brown and Clay, you can see, doubling the number of platforms and seen reversed in the previous building. It was all done within a year while passengers could pay for it in the new station. If only we could build stations that fast in the present day. The new station's most significant feature became its elaborate glazed canopies and roof, which provided protection from the rain between trains, boats, and also the much shorter uh, walk between platforms and pier. The new station became one of the uh, the showpiece of Scottish Railway is dominated by the effects of six foot in and style of Clock Tower. The station's here became renowned for its outstanding displays of pots of plants and hanging baskets, which sadly disappeared by the late 1780s. These have since been brought back thanks to the wonderful volunteer group of friends of Wednesday Station. The awarding masterpiece that it is was the first of Calder Railway Company's railway piers to be built. It is now the only remaining one. I'm sure members would agree with me that the building richly deserves its very listed architectural status. The graceful carved with elegant glass canopies, which still to this day protect passengers coming off the train or heading to the boat for connections to beautiful Isle of View. Many still coming to this day for that holiday through the water. So it should be no surprise that the station has been named one of the most beautiful stations in the world by House and Garden West. It has secured 34 place out of 37 stations recognised for their architecture. The only station in Scotland to feature on the list, where it was listed alongside internationally famous stations such as Amsterdam Central, New York Grand Central Station, and London's Times Cross. This recognition is a testament to the majestic building's architectural beauty, but it also recognises the hard work of the volunteer group Friends Wednesday Station and the fantastic Scotland staff put into keeping the building maintained. This significant achievement, I'm sure members will agree, will only help to increase tourism in terms of time by putting the other onto the world stage. Finally, I hope members will join me congratulating all involved in obtaining and looking after the station on this fantastic achievement and recognise the station as one of many gems on the trail from the play. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Cassidy, uh, for speaking so eloquently about what is, as you have said, uh, one of the, the gems of Inverclyde. 
Uh, can we agree, Councillor Cassidy's uh, very kind motion? Thanks, Mr. Uh, I just wanted to thank Councillor Cassidy for putting together that motion and delivering it really eloquently. Um, as a fellow Ward 6 councillor, I think it's really fantastic to see the achievement that Beam Space Station has uh, has achieved. Yeah. And I think the the um, the friends of Beams Bay, I would be remiss of me to not mention that Councillor Ernest Nelson was one of the founding members of that. And it's still going strong today, so thanks. Thank you, Councillor Pace. Uh, the motion is agreed. Yeah. Item number eight on the agenda. It's uh, the Treasury Management Annual Report, and it's a remit from the Policy and Resources Committee. Uh, Mr. Puckram, please. Thank you, Provost, and good afternoon, good afternoon everyone. Um, the report has been considered by the Policy and Resources Committee and in line with the regulatory requirements needs to be no approved by the Council. I'm happy to answer any questions that members may have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Puffin. This has, of course, already been the Policy and Resources Committee. Is there any questions for Mr Puffin? No, no, no. There are no questions. Thank you very much. Uh, taking number 10 on the uh, agenda, it's... Uh, Enhance naloxone action. It's a notice of motion by Councillor Daisy. Uh, Councillor Daisy would like to speak on your motion. Thank you, Provis. Um, firstly, just uh, want to acknowledge the great work that's been done in Amberclyde by the cross partnership approach on alcohol and drugs. Um, and when researching this, the feedback from all sides has, has been fantastically positive. And I would like to recognise and praise the great work being done. Um, so I just wanted to frame my motion, first of all, on the Social Work and Social Care Scrutiny Panel in August, the officer's report stated, firstly, that the evidence was clear that uh, wider distribution and training on how and when to administer naloxone saves lives, yet the table that I've included in the motion and the text below that table and that report showed that THN, which is take-home naloxone kit uptake, and number of was low. So I believe there's an opportunity there. Um, I wanted to clarify some of the points on on the motion because I believe there will be questions and, and there's an amendment as well, I believe, um, from uh, Councillor Jackson. Um, 3A, so I understand and recognise that it has been in the past discussions around mandatory training with trade unions and the feeling was at that time that it would not be supported. However, I believe that there's a reasonable it is reasonable for us to revisit this now. Um, the context of that would be around the Chief Officer identifying the relevant frontline staff that should be trained on a compulsory basis. And the carrying of kits should remain voluntary. Um, I believe that should be low, and, and I also believe that it should be introduced for new staff as well, relevant new staff. Um, the overwhelming message should be around education and engagement. Our support on this subject and our personal engagement could make a difference. And I feel that that's been proven really well with the recent pioneering of naloxone um, and our Inverclyde Police Force, led by Chief Inspector Paul Cameron, one of the first in Scotland to have officers carrying THN kits. And the public have been very positive around this. This could encourage trade unions to take another view as more prominent teams and individuals being trained will highlight just how vital this training is to saving lives. Um, point 3B, which I believe will probably be a wee bit more contentious than others. As community leaders, we may never see a situation where we would have to use these kits ourselves. And I get that, and I, and, I, and I understand that it could be seen as somewhat tokenistic. But having said that, by us personally leading, um, by example, we can encourage the third sector organisation, licensed premises, taxi drivers and community centres and our own individual wards to uptake the training and carry kits. And these will be the people who potentially could save the lives. Um, I've worded my motion, I believe, with humility in mind. So I'm humbly requesting that all members on an opt-in basis across every party and independence agree to the not zone training. This can be done as e-learning very easily. And I'm not suggesting that we all carry a kit. However, as a group uh, within the SNP, we have all agreed to carry one. Added to this, the SDF have agreed to trade us all as a group of councillors, 22 of us, 
and provide us each with a kit should we wish to take that offer up. And point 3C, just for clarification, very simply put, if something gets measured, it gets done. And the more detail we have around progress of training completion and kit delivery, the more opportunities we will be aware of and the more challenge and support we can provide as elected members. And I fully believe if we're going to challenge, we have to support as well. It's a numbers game. The more training and kits that are delivered, the more lives are potentially saved. And to, to quote Councillor Jackson, who is the chair of the social work and social care scrutiny panel, it remains the case and always will be the case that every death is a tragedy and represents the loss of someone's family or friend. The problem will not be fixed until we have no deaths, and I completely agree. So, finally, we have a chance here to take personal responsibility and to show our communities that we are prepared to do more than is expected of us, to support families and friends of service users, and to be leaders who lead by example. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Paisley. Uh, Councillor Reynolds. Thanks, Travis. Um, I've countersigned and uh, seconded Councillor uh, Daisley's motion. During 2021, NHS GGC ran the Community Pharmacy Opioid Overdose Campaign. This is a successful initiative may have in part uh, contributed to the drop um, in 2021-22 that you see in, in the, the briefing sheet, the drop in the locks and kit lock taking and required, however. It's important to keep the momentum going, and as elected members, um, that we join police, paramedics, NHS staff, third party organisations to lead by example in this life saving campaign. The data shows that most drug deaths in Inverclyde are among the methadone patients um, in our communities that take methadone plus maybe one or more of their drugs. These patients are easily identified by community pharmacy. And it's vital that their family and friends continue to be made aware and given easy access to naloxone training and kits in order to have the opportunity to save a loved one's life. I visited all Inverclyde community pharmacies in my role as HSCP pharmacy champion in the last couple of weeks. Um, and all of them are on board with taking part in another awareness campaign, um, perhaps using some of the resources that were used last time, which we still have to um, investigate. Mental health services have also indicated to me um, their support for this motion. They recognise that as community leaders we should lead by example and enable patients, family and friends to have the confidence to undertake training, carry a kit and potentially save a life. Thank you, Councillor Reynolds. Does anybody else want to speak to this motion? Councillor Jackson, please. Yeah, this, um, um, you know, I thank Councillor Baisley uh, for bringing this motion to the full council today. I mean, we fully support it. As we all know, there's been far too many avoidable drug related deaths in the plague. Uh, so, I would like to put forward an amendment to the motion, uh, having discussed it with James, um, specifically around uh, mandatory training. Uh, so, <laughs> on the motion, it's going to uh, Mr. Stagg has the amendment. Thank you. Also, want to add is that I commend as chair for the open convener for the speaking panel that I've been out. The great change of house, a very broad organisation for people who make families uh, and uh, people who are in recovery. I think it's all very well to get an academic kind of viewpoint of how we come up with this, but I've also come out with a view that there's no kind of real visceral understanding from people involved in drug addiction. You know, they're, they're very, there's a lot of academic research out there, which a lot of this is based on, but I would encourage anybody in here to go out and meet with people involved and get a better understanding. Um, so, so, I've got the, the motion in front of you. Part one of the motion, part two of the motion, I absolutely agree. Fully, we couldn't agree more with it. The only contentious issue is that of mandatory training. So, in part 3A, I'd like to take out the first part of it and it would read that our staff and trade union partners are consulted on whether the loss on training should become mandatory for the other HSCP staff, being those staff identified by the Chief Officer HSP 
rather than voluntary. With all other things, you to start proper training on a voluntary basis. I don't think it's only for us to start to mandate staff to take part in this. So, again, as much as I support it, that's part B of it. Part B, again, does support the Academy of Takes Home the Locks in, it remains voluntary, although strongly encouraged as a culture within the Indian Council. Part C, really just the first line of that, that the Locks in training is made available to all elected members on a voluntary basis. The rest of Part C uh, is absolutely agree with Sir James. When it comes to Part D of the motion, just at the start, I'd like to change it to that the Council of Rights the Chair of the IGB seeking confirmation that regular reports on teaching can uptake are provided in the IGB performance reporting with annual reporting from the Alcohol Group Partnership or not take also go to the Alliance for the Social Work and Scrutiny, and the Social Care Scrutiny and Promoting. Again, the rest of James's motion part B, I agree with. So I would ask uh, members to consider, it's really only about the mandate for training and reporting. Um, part we take to put that in the trees. Thank you, Councillor Jackson. Uh, Kate Rocks, uh, would you like to uh, comment on what we have uh, in front of us now? Yeah, thank you, Chair. I just want to thank all the members for raising this issue. It's probably our most challenging issue within Inverclyde, um, alongside our cost of living. I agree that there needs to be an increased uh, uh, focus on the Loxon. And as part of the response, our, 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 our current response is to ensure that we develop, we deal with our drug deaths in a multi-agency way and it's a partnership approach. So key workers in HSCP are already trained um, to carry naloxone, um, particularly in the Inverclyde Centre where we are more likely to see um, in any overdoses. Also, the partners in police and fire and third sector now carry this. And as already been stated, we are probably in the forefront of our, of of kind of showing a really positive example to the rest of Scotland around that whole systems approach. Following this motion, I will discuss at the staff partnership forum um, some of the motions that have been there. I appreciate that Councillor Jackson, who is um, my convener of the Social Work and Social Care um, Committee has advised about some caution around mandating staff, but I will seek the views of the unions. I've got a meeting with them tomorrow about the mandatory elements that are in the motions. We have the we I, we I, we do have really strong governance structures to scrutinise this, and I'm actually very mindful of. Um, Councillor Daisley's um, response and Councillor Reynolds about the impact on the community because I think sometimes we just look at our partners and the professionals and actually some of the solutions lie within families and within the community and peers themselves. The vast majority of our drug deaths happen in, um, in our um, and in our users' houses um, with other um, peers or with family members in prison. I mean, um, so in some ways at times it's very hidden to services. So I will ask the chair of the ADP to provide regular reporting to the IGB and obviously the Alliance Board um, because of the multi-agency and um, we'll, we'll update the scrutiny board about the um, the impact of the no, in, any increase in the um, and the locks and um, carrying and uh, administration, though it is quite hard to um, work out from the data nationally <clears throat> about the impact of that because there's various um, reporting area, agencies that report into it. Um, but I, I would just thank this the the members for this motion. Thank you, Sox. Uh, Councillor Law? 
Thank you, Fergus. Um, I would like to publicly state my support for Councillor Desley's motion. I look forward to completing my training. I'm sure I'm not the only member here who has personal experience of an associate who sadly succumbed to addiction. The number of drug and alcohol deaths in this area prove how widespread the issue is and should be of utmost concern to us all. I hope this motion to support life-saving intervention will be a step in a wider effort to tackle the ongoing addiction issues we have in Inverclyde. Thank you, Councillor Law. Councillor Buskin. Thanks, Rob. I just want to speak briefly to um, formally second Councillor Jackson's um, amendment. Um, I think from what we've just heard from uh, Kate Rocks a moment ago, I think the amendment is a sensible approach to make sure that what we're um, putting forward is actually workable. Um, and also as a, as a, as a proud trade unionist myself, I'd also rather make sure that we consult with the trade unions ahead of um, any suggestion that we make this training mandatory. And as for the, the final section of Councillor Jackson's um, amendment for more reporting, I think um, Councillor Daisley himself made the point that we need to count these things for them to be um, meaningful. Um, and I would hope, to, hope that that would be included as well so that we can actually make sure that progress is made over the next period of time. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Plusky. Is there anybody else going to speak? Just now, Councillor? Thank, thank you, Prof. Um, obviously, we welcome this motion of the Council of Daisley. But I think the people talk about their walks in this chamber, it's just a, just a word, it's just a name. If you talk to some of the staff, which, which I have to, we've had to use the walks in. It comes in three separate forms. There's the, the JAG, and there's also a nasal way. Now, if you spoke to anyone who's had to administer that, they will tell you in a total state of shock, and they were trained professionals who trained to use it. But people run about, I'm sorry, with the lottery kits on them. It just does not make sense. They don't want to make that sense. Because I am a fully trained first aider. I remember the first time we found someone. We got all the training in the world. The guy was lying, and it was a classic symptoms of the were vomit and he throw and everything else. We had to remove his false teeth and mirrors it mouth to mouth and uh, the heart resuscitation. And I can assure you, there were people who jumped out of the road, fully trained people, just could not handle the situation we're in. We have to be very, very careful in who gets these naloxone kits. And I think also, as you say, we're going right to the chair of IGB and asking how many times we use, how many times have we used it? Councillor Dafer says uh, the local police have done a great job. Councillor Daisley, this was piloted in Dundee, Falkirk and Glasgow before it came to Amberclyde. So it's not as if we are ahead of the game. We are not. And I'll tell you now, as someone who has been in situations very similar, I don't think people should run about with a locks on, kits on them. I think we go to the people who are front line service, the people who might have to use it. Certainly not to the general public, anyone who feels it up, they could do a train and they, they could administer a locks on. Because I would ask you, do you know how you, how you would administer it if somebody was, if you had a kit and there was something lying, what would you do? If I was trained, if I was trained. So exactly. Aye. What you do, you, you fire it into their leg. That's what you do. Now, how would I put this walk to staff that had to use that? And they're very upset because all the locks and so on, frontline services to use it in well. So, as much as I agree with it, I think make that uh, available to so many members of the public and even councillors is not the way forward. Thank you, Councillor Ryan. Councillor McGuire, please. Thank you. Sorry, I've got two separate things. I've got one question just to kind of do with the process that this came to council, just for my own clarification, and I've actually got something to say on the motion as well. So, can I just ask for clarification? Why wasn't this marked as a say item for full council? At the scrutiny panel, just um, I'm kind of wondering why this is as a motion when actually we've just agreed minutes earlier on of the meeting. Can I just clarify that, please? Mr. Shackle. Yeah, no, thanks, Councillor McGuire. So, no, this was a separate uh, written notice of a motion to full council that Councillor Daisley submitted. It wasn't didn't come via uh, a committee or a scrutiny panel. All right, okay. So nobody asked for it to come to council through the panel. Then that's okay. Thank you for confirming that. I think the, the crux of the question is we've approved a minute 
in a minute, specifically refers to training being voluntary of HSCP staff. And we've got a motion potentially that seeks to make it mandatory. There is a potential conflict you know, between what we've agreed at the, the panel and approved as a as a true record here. I think that's the question. Councillor McVeigh. Oh, sorry, I had a second part. Oh, so, sorry, sorry. Apologies, apologies, Councillor McVeigh. Um, I wasn't expecting to have um, yeah, to have that clarification. Sorry. So my second part to that, I just needed that to confirm for my own peace of mind. So I agree in principle with what Councillor Daisley has brought before us, but I do believe more needs to be done. I think that the 32 down 16 deaths that we've seen has been a combination of variety of factors from like the police seizing more drugs to the interventions that have already been put in place by the HSCP and our council. I'm also agreeing in principle that this is good. I think that the Scottish government needs to do more work with the council to try and prevent people from getting to this stage. Addicts whose lives are controlled by these substances, as um, Kate Rock said, it's a very hidden thing when people do tend to overdose. So more needs to be done to try and prevent people getting to that stage. So whilst I see this as a good motion in principle, I think that a wider view and more salient solutions are needed to help those who are vulnerable through the addiction to stop overdose from happening, and thus this needing to be put in place. Um, I do, however, have reservations about making it mandatory, just because I know that some people may not may not want to take up the training, but I am happy to do the training. Thank you, Provost. Thank you, Councillor Maguire. Uh, Councillor McVeigh, and Councillor Quinn, please. Yeah, thank you, Provost. Uh, I think uh, I would commend Councillor Daisley uh, mm -hmm. for bringing the motion forward. Uh, also, Councillor Reynolds for uh, seconding, and again, Councillor Jackson for his interview, Provost, because I think you. Um, uh, I'm quite confident if you can get the, the, the right wording right, I'll, I'll be happy to support the motion uh, as it comes forward. But I think we do miss the point here, Provost. I think the drug test scandals in Scotland, uh, the statistics are a scandal. They're the worst in Europe by far. And uh, the, the First Minister herself has accepted responsibility, stating they should take an eye open all of that. And until we address the chronic underfunding of drug and alcohol partnerships across the country, we will not see this issue improve. I hope we do. But fear we may be having uh, similar types of discussions in the future. Uh, hopefully not, but that is my fear. But I will support uh, hopefully the motion which the both can bring together. Thank you, Councillor Quinn. Yeah, thank you, uh, just want to thank again, thank Councillor Dayton for bringing it forward and for Councillor uh, Jackson's uh, amendment. Uh, it's really important for us to have these discussions here. Uh, so I very much welcome. <coughs> Excuse me, but very much welcome bringing it here and having discussions. And as Councillor Law said, I think we've all been touched some point in our lives by addiction, you know, and loss of family members or friends due to that. Um, so I've really just, the only bit under here that I've still got a concern about is the mandatory element of it. I'm more a carrot person than a stick. So I always have serious concerns when we make something mandatory because it then doesn't become a choice and people sometimes don't enter with the right frame of mind. So that that is, to be totally honest, is still a concern of mine. Uh, and also uh, whether um, we can make the staff you know, shoulder more responsibility than anyone else, because we talk about partnership working. This is a partnership, you know, a Police Scotland, you know, partners coming together to share the load on here, because I don't think it's a, an issue that just one organisation can fix. Uh, so, and actually, probably me sitting here as an elected member, so I just noticed the words is that we're making it voluntary for, for ourselves, but we're make it mandatory for staff. I don't think I could sit here as an elected member and make any training mandatory for staff, especially when it's not in there, even from a legal point of view. How do we insist that if it's not in terms of conditions of their employment? So I'm really uncomfortable with making it mandatory when we're actually making it voluntary for ourselves. So uh, so I really still have issues, even we call it Councillor Jackson's motion, because in effect we are still exploring the option of it be mindful, whether I would think we should make it voluntary. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ben. 
Before we go any further, I'd like to bring the chief executive in here. Two equals, thank you very much. It's very interesting. I'm very heartened by the debate in relation to members and their interests in relation to this particular subject. People will know I was the director of health and social care, and it was me that asked the unions if we could make it mandatory, and they said absolutely no. Uh, we under no circumstances. And I will be very surprised if they made it, they will be they'll be able to keep to make it mandatory. I think we're in danger of losing some of the good stuff in relation to this motion that elected members genuine interest in their Prexone, a genuine interest in doing something about uh, drug deaths by the issue in relation to mandatory. It's also in the minute of the social work scrutiny panel uh, that you've just agreed. And so I think there may well be something in relation to standard orders. If we if we look at this as mandatory, we might need to suspend standard orders, but I'll let Ian come in on that. The easiest way in relation to this, we'll way through this, so that I would strongly recommend, and has worked well, because the staff in the Everglade Trend Centre um, volunteered to be trained. And I have been in the Everglade Centre um, when they have been um, administrating um, Nortrexone. I've also been up with drugs workers who are also trained, and I've also been with some of their third sector who are trained as well. And I think that voluntary, the people that want to do it, they want to keep the training up to date, they want to be very focused on making a difference, is probably the best way forward. Uh, however, I'll leave it for members, and I think Ian may need to come in at the end to say whether we need to legally suspend standing orders. Yeah, but before we go on, but what we have here is uh, a very well intentioned. Uh, notice of motion that I think is receiving uh, pretty well unanimous support. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Daisley is put in this, Daisley is with Councillor Jackson, and I think between them uh, that they've sorted out a, a thing of words. But there are issues as the Chief Executive. Uh, as, can I suggest that we leave this as it is with? Uh, Officers to bring forward uh, a condensed notice of the motion that Councillor Daisley can present at the next. We can deal with it just now. Yeah, thanks. So. Okay, so. what do we have to do to deal with it? Second, David. Right. So, I think the point picked up by, um, by, by Councillor McKay was that when the Social Work Supervisory Panel considered this, it approved that training be delivered to both HSCP and council staff on a voluntary basis. And the question is, what well, does that mean that looking to potentially subject to consultation make it mandatory now? Does that mean we need to suspend standing orders? And to be absolutely fair to the councillors, uh, Daisy and Reynolds, I didn't think of that when it came through. So, so that's my fault for not picking that, picking that up. I was, and I've been looking at it as, as we're speaking and trying to find a way, but I think the only logical conclusion is that, given the decision of the panel was only in August, that doing it less than six months arguably would be contradictory, in which case we would need to suspend the standing orders, which is two-thirds, which for 22 members is 15. I think probably the union wouldn't you know, there'd, there'd then be consultation with, with, uh, with the unions anyway. And um, so I think that to consider, um, certainly, we ask that there be the consultation with staff and unions around making that mandatory uh, to potentially include that in the decision. We would suspend standing orders for that. And my apologies to Councillor Faisley and others. So, uh, my, my question to the members would be uh, do you wish to carry on with this today uh, and follow through a process? Because what I'm feeling that I've got in front of me here is that we have a notice of motion here and a very, very much changed kind of amendment. And I really, uh, I would probably need time to focus on it and see well, what, what is required. Uh, but I'm prepared to suspend standing orders if, if we can get this as a vote. Can we agree to suspend standing orders? Yeah. Anybody otherwise minded? Can, can I just get clarity? Do we need to su suspend standing orders? If the amendment is passed, or is the amendment okay not to suspend standing orders? No, because I think the amendment, in, in essence, it, it, in a slightly different way, also says, you know, ask that nothing is done around making training mandatory without the necessary consultation. Which comes in six months. Mr. Jackson? 
Yeah, I mean, that's, that's very much what uh, the, the amendment is. Uh, uh, Councillor Quinn uh, mentioned the fact that she's not comfortable with the, the mandatory hearing at all. All we're asking is to consult with the trade unions uh, to see who or, uh, uh, the chief officer, uh, uh, chief executive, are not in favour of it. Uh, so, as it stands, I don't think uh, the motion, uh, as it is, uh, will be supported uh, in the amendment. Uh, uh, highlights that, that you know we don't want mandatory training uh, for staff or for uh, uh, for elected members uh, and for uh, more informed uh, reporting to the IGB. So we're, we're not looking to support mandatory training. Personal uh, friend, we're looking for uh, the opinion of the trade unions of staff. And that's what what we're looking for. Uh, I would propose to put the council into a five minute recess into this meeting. Uh, is that the meeting with agreement? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And number three, uh, will training become mandatory and after the word mandatory, uh, insert in the future? And I think we've agreed this form of words for the Rocks to take away. Uh, for consultation and bring back to uh, a future council meeting. Does that mean with everybody's approval here? Yes. 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 Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes. Uh, we have uh, some business to, in the private session. We have to put the, uh, the meeting into private session to cover some of the minutes that we're taking.